This video is going to get you through the principles of microscopy notes that you have. It's chapter three in your textbook. Uh, we're skipping chapter two because that's chemistry. You should have had that in whatever previous science courses that you've had for majors. You should have had it in um, freshman bio and you should have had it in your chemistry class. And for those of you that are non-majors, you probably had it in an AMP course. So if you need a refresher on chemistry, please go back and read chapter two. But I'm going to blow past it and go straight to chapter three and assume you remember some of your chemistry. So this class is of course very microscope heavy since it is microbiology. We talked about what microbes were in the first chapter. You need a microscope to see them. That's a big part of the reason of why you can't do this lab at home. You don't have a $1,200 microscope probably at home where you can view these organisms. And so you've got to come to lab so you can get used to the microscope, get used to how you prep a slide, and then finding things under that microscope. So this is a eukaryote. We talked a little bit about what eukaryotes were in the first chapter. This is an amoeba. It is a single-celled, used to be in the kingdom Protista. Now we're arguing about does it belong in the kingdom Animalia again. Um, it's eating some little algae right off over here, but the big cell, that is an amoeba. And even though it's a big cell, you do still need a microscope in order to see it. Um, you guys are going to be responsible for learning how to recognize an amoeba. That's going to be in the first at-home lab that you do after we do microscopes on Tuesday. So Wednesday is when you're going to be learning about eukaryotes in a little bit more detail. And so that's why I wanted to show you amoeba. Spirogyra is another one that I usually do. I don't remember if I put it in the lab for you guys this time, but this is Spirogyra. It's another one that used to be a protist. It's probably supposed to be in the kingdom plantae. It has a ribbon-shaped chloroplast that runs through there. So it is a eukaryotic cell because chloroplast is a membrane-bound organelle. It does also have a nucleus in it. This one has not been stained, so you can't see the nucleus very well. If you stained it, you would, but that would also kill the organism. All right. So next you have who was Hans Christian Graham and what technique did he develop as my computer is thinking about what it wants to do. Um, who knows what it's playing around with in the back. So um, get the little story that you have up there. So Danish physician. Uh, the Graham stain is a differential stain and what that means is it stains different organisms in different colors. That helps us to classify bacteria in this case into two different groups. We're going to have Graham positive organisms and Graham negative organisms. As it turned out, there's a very fundamental difference in anatomy and cell structure between gram-positive and gram-negative organisms, and so his stain also helps us treat bacteria based on what they look like under the microscope. So he's the gentleman who came up with the procedure that is the gram stain that you guys are going to be doing, I think the second time that we meet for class in person for lab, it was when we're going to do that the first time. Um, this is what a gram stain slide end up look li looking like. You end up with some pink organisms and some purple organisms if you have a mixture of organisms that you put on the slide. If something stains pink, it is a gram negative organism. And there's a difference in the cell wall of that organism versus a gram positive, which stains purple under the microscope. We're also going to be talking about shape in a little bit of detail in, the, I think, the next chapter. So this is a bacillus. These are really short rods or caucuses. It's honestly kind of hard to tell. These look more like short rods, but those look more like caucuses, or cocci is the plural of caucus, but that's those guys. Uh, compare and contrast prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We did this a little bit in the first chapter, so just coming into it in a little bit more detail. Remember that the two domains of life that are prokaryotic are the bacteria and the archaeans. The only domain that is eukaryotic is eukarya. Um, for the prokaryotic cells, you need to remember that they are tiny cells that don't have a nucleus, but they have been on the planet for longer. Again, our first fossils of life are of prokaryotic organisms. Eukaryotic, on the other hand, though, they're typically larger cells. They do have nuclei, or at least one nucleus. These happen to be multinucleate cells in this picture. Um, but they have to at least have one in order to be classified as a eukaryotic cell. Um, and so these are eukaryotic versus those are prokaryotic. Mm -hmm. Let's see, how does a light microscope work? These are the, light, uh, the microscopes that we're going to be using in lab and in whatever class that you've had before this that was science-based, whether it was A&P or freshman bio, you used a light microscope in that lab. Um, there's different names for these. They can also be called binocular scopes because they have two eyepieces. Um, they can also be called compound scopes because they have a couple of sets of lenses that we'll go over a little bit more in lab. But the way a light microscope works is it has a light source. The light passes through an organism on the slide that you're trying to look at, 
and then you see the light passing through that organism. Depending on which objective you use when you're using the microscope, you can magnify up to a thousand times on the scopes in our lab. They do make other objectives that can magnify more, but I wanted to give you the numbers for our labs. If you're using um, the one that has a white stripe around it, that's called the oil immersion lens, and that one can magnify up to a thousand times when you calculate the total magnification of the scope. What is an electron microscope? So this one does not use light to view the image. It uses a beam of electrons that it passes through or bombards a, an organism so that you can see it. Because it's not using light, the images produced are always going to be black and white. If you see one that's been colorized, it's been colorized by a computer or by an artist. And so it's important that you understand those colors aren't natural. They were created by a person to make it more artistic or more visually interesting whenever you're looking at something that was um, created with an electron microscope. Um, there's different setups for this. Sometimes you can see through something, sometimes you just see the surface of something, but as a general rule they have much higher magnification than a light microscope and they usually have much better resolution, which we'll talk about what that means here in just a little bit. Um, Next up, there's different ways that you can use light to help you see an organism. Bright field means that you're illuminating everything. This is again what our microscopes are. So our, our microscopes in lab are binocular, compound, light microscopes that have a bright field. I know that's a lot, but that helps describe everything that our microscopes are capable of. Now this is a slide from the AMP lab. I don't know how much you guys are going to flash back to tissues, but here we have some stratified squamous epithelial tissue. We've got some dermis, some hypodermis, and then we start to get into muscle off down here at the bottom. So this is through skin. You can even see a hair follicle coming off over here. This image was created with a light microscope using a bright field. Mm. Next, dark field. Um, you can either have a special microscope that shines a light at an angle or you can create the slide so that the slide creates a dark field, but if we're talking about a dark field microscope, then the microscope is doing the light at an angle so that you're seeing unstained things a little bit better. Um, light, as it turns out, when it's something is too bright, it makes it a lot harder to see, so hitting it at that angle lets you see it a little bit better. Um, this was a slide prepped with a dark field for a light field microscope, so it creates that impression of a dark field because of that black wax in the background. But then they put the organisms, unfortunately, I think it says arranged parts of butterflies and beetles, but I'm not really sure what it says off down there. So they have taken like wings and stuff and arranged it artfully. They used to be very proud of the slides that they made and when high society got together, they would have microscopes set up sort of like in a museum and people would go up and look at it. And so this is one of those slides that were created and it would use a dark field because of the dark background. Mm. Okay, phase contrast. Um, so the definition is up there for you guys. What I kind of wanted to show you is the difference between how that looks. So when you look through a standard light microscope, this is what a red blood cell would look like. Um, we've got other types of cells and organisms coming off over here. When you do phase contrast though, because you're playing around with the difference in refractive index between the slide and the organism, you can see edges a little bit better when you do a phase contrast. And so this is the same red blood cell slide, but it's made on a phase contrast microscope instead of a traditional light microscope. And so you can see they just look different. You can see the edges a lot clearer on this one versus here you kind of get a halo and a distortion around the edges. Same on these, you can see the texture a little bit better. So phase contrast, you see unstained things and you see edges and, and three dimensions a little bit better with a phase contrast prep. Fluorescence is usually done by adding a fluorescent stain to the cells or the organisms that you're trying to view under the microscope. So these are just some, I wonder if I wrote the name down. They're probably HeLa cells, but there's some random animal cells if they're not HeLa cells. They have put different fluorescent stains on that attach to different portions of the cytoskeleton so that what you're seeing is the microtubules are in kind of that ready orange and then the actin filaments are in sort of that green and then the DNA is that purple in the middle. And so the fluorescent stain allows us to view different types of materials inside the cell, different colors, and it fluoresces so it's bright when you look at it under the microscope. Um, transmission versus scanning electron microscopes goes back to you can see through it or you can see the surface of it. Transmission lets you see through an object. So here in this picture you're looking through mitochondria and you can see the cristae which are the shelves of uh, phospholipid bilayer inside the increased surface area so that your cells can make more ATP. If we couldn't see through it you wouldn't be able to see those shelves on the inside of the mitochondria. 
scanning on the other hand just lets you see the surface of something so you can't see the organs of these mites but you can see the exoskeleton of these mites um my note says this is a european red spider mite unless this is the european red spider mite i bet this is I should really take better notes. I think these are just regular old dust mites that you can find on different things, and then this is the European red spider mite. Remember my note that I said earlier, if it's something in color, that means somebody sat there and artistically painted it on the computer to make it colored, because the electron microscope can't take color images. It can only do black and white pictures. Okay, so coming back to, I said that our microscopes are, <coughs> pardon me, compound. Compound means it has two sets of lenses. It has the eyepiece lenses, which magnify by their own rate, and our microscopes magnify by a factor of 10 in the eyepiece lenses. And then you have the objective lenses. Each objective lens has its own set magnification rate. Our microscopes in lab typically have a red one, which is called scanning. That magnifies by a factor of 4. To find the total magnification of the microscope, you multiply the eyepiece magnification times the objective lens magnification. So for that red scanning objective that magnifies by a factor of four, you would do four times 10, and that would mean when you're using the scanning objective, it's making everything 40 times bigger because four times 10 is 40. We have a yellow objective that's low power. It magnifies by a factor of 10, so its total magnification is 100x. We have a blue objective that's high dry or high power. It magnifies by a factor of 40, so that's giving you a total magnification of 400x. And then we have oil immersion lenses that are only to be used on slides that don't have a cover slip. They magnify by a factor of 100 to give you a total magnification of 100x. So compound because two lenses. Let's see, you have objective lens to define next. So the objective lenses are what I like to call powers in the lab, like they're scanning power, low power, high power. Each objective lens, again, magnifies by its own set rate based on the lens that's present in the bottom of those. Um, you, our microscopes, you can just swivel from one power to the next power. You don't have to raise or lower the stage. You just swivel it around so you can see it. The only time you have to be careful is if you have a high cover slip, you don't want to use the oil immersion lens. In fact, if you have a cover slip at all, I'm going to tell you don't use the oil immersion lens. The ocular lens is also called the eyepiece, and so our microscopes have two eyepieces, but each eye does only see through one of them. Um, so again, to find the total magnification, which is the next thing you have, it's the ocular or eyepiece lens times whichever objective you're using, which in this case, it's the one that points straight down. We don't have one that's orange, so I'm really not sure what the power is on this orange one, but let's say that it's 100x. That would be 10 times 100 gets you 1,000x. That's how you calculate total magnification. Okay. Resolving power is essentially how clear an image is when you view it. So whenever you see pictures in your lab manual, they're always going to tell you how big the, the magnification is for that particular image. And so both of these images were magnified by a factor of 450. So they're both 450 times bigger in this picture than they were in the real world. What I want you to notice, though, is look how much clearer and crisper this image is and how fuzzy this one is. That's because an electron microscope has better resolving power and a light microscope, it doesn't have as good a resolving power. Now, another way to look at resolving power is to kind of come up over here. Each one of these little pictures has five vertical bars and five horizontal bars. And there comes a point where your eyes can't see five bars anymore. And it's different for everybody's eyes and it depends on whether you're wearing contacts or glasses and a whole bunch of things. But you can kind of see what your eyes resolving powers are based on when you can no longer see five horizontal and five vertical lines. I lose it right around 2.5, but again, everybody's a little bit different. I've got older eyes. Some of you may be able to see five on this one. God, you have great eyes if you can see, still, still see five on that one, but everybody's eyes do have different resolving power. Um, okay, so just a quick question that I usually ask when we're doing this in class. So hopefully you would be able to tell me that this is a eukaryotic cell fairly quickly because there's a really obvious nucleus in there. So that's a eukaryotic cell. Next up, contrast is how easy it is for you to see something under the, under the microscope. A lot of the organisms that we look at are going to be clear, which means they are very difficult to see when you're trying to find them under the microscope. So one of the ways that we can improve contrast is to add stain to a slide. So for example, these are onion cells under the microscope, and you can see the cell wall pretty clearly. The cell wall has good contrast. But it's a lot harder to see each nucleus present inside of that cell because the nucleus doesn't have good contrast. 
If we were to add a stain to this, like methylene blue, you'd be able to see those nuclei a lot more clearly. So just how clear or dark something happens to look. Um, one of the things you can do to play around with contrast is to play with the diaphragm and um, the, oh my goodness, I've just lost the name, the condenser knob that can move the uh, one of the lenses under the stage up or down so that you can kind of change where the light's focusing on a slide. Both of those things can help you out with contrast when you're playing around with the microscope in lab. Um, okay, so which of those was taken with a scanning electron micrograph? Well, in order for you to answer that, you have to remember which kind of electron microscope goes um, through something versus on the surface of something, because in this one you're seeing through the cell, versus this one you're just seeing the outside surface. Scanning just sees the outside surface, and so this image is the one that was taken with a scanning electron microscope. Um, how can we increase the contrast in our lab? Usually we do it just by adding stain, but again, you can play with the light a little bit too to try to help you out. What is the benefit of a wet mount? This is the only way that you can view a living organism because all of the stains that we use in lab are toxic and will kill live organisms. So if you make a wet mount, you can actually see a living organism swimming around. I think we're gonna make a wet mount of some yogurt so you can see some of the bacteria and yogurt swimming around. But if you were to add stain to that, you would kill all of them and they would stop swimming around. And so the wet mount lets you see them moving and swimming and living their lives. And in some cases, even eating other cells is something that you can see. All right, model organisms for this one. So Trypanema pallidum is the organism that you see in this slide. And I'm giving you a hint when I give you this picture up here. Um, what disease does it cause? Syphilis, which is an STD. Why will bright field microscopy not work well for this organism? The cells are really thin and they really don't pick up stain very well, so you can't enhance the contrast with staining. And so we tend to use negative stains or that dark field microscope. Again, this picture was taken with a dark field microscope. And so you can see the cell as this bright little corkscrew shaped thing going on right here um, versus the background is this dark. Hmm. Let's see next up, what kind of microscope would you use? Dark field just said that. You could also do a negative stain if that was gonna be helpful. Uh, what domain does it belong in? It is bacteria. Um, it's not a eukaryotic cell. Hopefully you can tell that because there's no nucleus anywhere on here. Um, because it is a human pathogen, that's your giveaway that it's not going to be in the domain archaea. Next up, pox viruses like varicella. Uh, what disease does varicella specifically cause? Chicken pox the first time around. And then what people don't understand is that virus never leaves your body. It's what's known as a chronic infection. Um, it can come back later on as shingles, which is a very painful burning sensation that can develop. And so this is what varicella zoster, which causes chicken pox and shingles looks like. What kind of microscope would be used to view this agent and why would you use that one? Well, you need an electron microscope because if you think bacteria are small, viruses are even smaller than that. You will not see a virus under our microscopes in lab because we just don't have the magnification abilities on our microscopes in lab. You need an electron microscope or even a more powerful one to be able to see a virus. Um, why did you choose that? Again, it magnifies enough. Is it living or non-living? Again, we could argue about that. It's a virus. To me, that's not alive. All right, simple stain is the first thing we're going to do in lab when we actually start doing stuff on day one. It means that you stain the organism with just one stain and then you start viewing it. So you kind of did one of those when you did the cheek smear and whatever previous courses that you've had. Um, negative stain means that you stain the slide and not the organism. And so these are bacillus cells under the microscope. You can see that the slide is very dark. This is a negative stain. So stain the slide, not the organism. Stain the organism just one color for simple stain. Differential staining is what you guys have next. It means that you stain different organisms, different colors, but with the same protocol. Now, again, Hans Christian Graham was the first person who came up with the differential stain. It's called the Graham stain today, and it gives you that Graham negative, Graham positive classification from earlier. There are other ones too. The only other one that we're gonna talk about in any detail is acid fast staining, which stains some special species of bacteria pink. Those are called acid fast organisms. And if something ends up being blue, then it's not acid fast. So stains different organisms, different colors. Um, what type of stain is the Graham stain? Differential. How is it performed? These are the steps. We're gonna do this a lot on like the second or third time that we meet together for lab. 
Um, this is something that you have to do to identify your unknown when we get to that as one of the last things that we do in the lab. And so it's something that you're going to practice over and over again to make sure you can do it before we get there. But step one, after you have already heat fixed your slide, you add crystal uh, violet to your emulsion that's on the slide. Um, you let that sit for 60 seconds and then you rinse. After the rinse, you add iodine, you let that sit for 60 seconds, and then you rinse. After that, you do a rinse with alcohol. This is the most likely place that you screw up if you screw up, and it's because there's not a specific time frame for how long the alcohol is being rinsed on the slide. It depends on how thick your emulsion is. It depends on how many organisms you have in the slide. It depends on a whole bunch of different factors. So if you have a really thin emulsion with very few organisms in it, you can decolorize in 10 seconds. But if you have a really thick emulsion, you might have to stain for 30, or decolorize, pardon me, for 30 seconds. And so it varies, and it's something that you just have to kind of learn on your own to, as you go through things but it's the most common place where students screw up and then end up with bad results. After you decolorize, you immediately rinse with water and then you counter stain with saffronin. Um, saffronin stays on for 60 seconds and then you rinse, you blot dry and you start viewing. And again, you're gonna do all those steps in lab so you become secondhand at being able to tell what a gram stain is and how you do it. Uh, what type of stain is the acid fast stain? I already said that. Um, it's a differential stain. How is it performed? Um, first, you add carbol fusion, that's C-A-R-B-O-L, and then fusion is F-U-S-C-H-I-N. Uh, then you rinse that off. Next, you add acid alcohol. Um, that's a mixture of an acid and alcohol put together and you decolorize. Uh, then you do a counter stain with methylene blue. Um, why would this technique be used instead of a gram stain? You use this for specific infections that you suspect that are caused by a genus called Mycobacterium. Um, it's M-Y-C-O-B-A-C-T-E-R-I-U-M and then underline it because that's a genus. Mycobacterium causes really bad diseases like leprosy and tuberculosis and both of those diseases are still present out in the world, but if you suspect that a person has those, you don't do a gram stain, you do an acid fast stain, and then they would appear pink whenever you do the acid fast stain. This happens to be what tuberculosis looks like after an acid fast stain. All right, model organisms again, Klebsiella pneumoniae. What disease does it cause? It's in the name, pneumonia. Um, I do also want you to make a note, this is the most common type of pneumonia that is acquired in a hospital, so it's called a nosocomial infection which I think we defined in the last chapter too. Uh, what kind of cell does this organism has? As you look at it off over here, you should be able to tell me by now, is that pro or eukaryotic? It's pro. Uh, what do domain does it belong to? It's a human pathogen that's prokaryotic, so it's bacteria. Is this organism part of the normal microbiota? And if so, where is it usually found? Yes, it is actually part of your normal flora. You normally find it in the mouth, the skin, and the intestines you do not normally find it in the lungs. And so that's why people can end up getting that infection in the hospital is because it gets introduced into a place where it's not supposed to be. Which type of stain would you use to identify a gram stain? This shows you how it gram stains. And so I've, I've said it once before, but you should get used to telling me, is this gram positive or gram negative based on the stain? Since it's pink, that's gram negative. So it's a gram negative organism. Next, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, what disease does it cause? Again, it's in the name, TB or tuberculosis. What domain does it belong to? Uh, well, it's prokaryotic and it causes disease, so again, bacteria. Uh, what type of stain could help you identify it? Acid fast stain, because it's a mycobacterial species and that species cannot be gram stained. You have to do an acid fast stain on them. Next up, we're gonna go over some of the shapes that you can find in bacterial cells. This is one of the things that can help you identify the causative agent for a particular disease. You gram stain them or acid fast stain them or you do some other kind of stain and then you start viewing it under the microscope. E. coli looks very different from Staph aureus and part of that difference, in addition to the gram stain, is the shape of those cells is different. So caucus, this is their shape. You write down whatever that looks like to you, ball shaped, spherical, round, whatever, this is a caucus. Bacillus, rod-shaped, dash-shaped, rectangular, column-shaped, whichever one it looks like to you, write that down. Whenever we ask you in lab for what shape it is, we don't want you to tell us rectangular or round, we want you to tell us caucus or bacillus, and so get used to using those names. 
These shapes are also very often part of the genus name of organisms. So that staph infection I mentioned earlier, staph is short for staphylococcus. And so you would know that if you see something that's round under the microscope, it could be staphylococcus. And we'll talk about the staphylo part here in just a second too. Uh, Vibrio is a short bent rod, so comma shaped if you kind of want to call it that. This one can be kind of hard to see under the microscope because depending on how the cell lays on the slide, sometimes it's obvious where the bend is. Sometimes it's a lot more difficult to see. So make, a, make sure you look at a bunch of cells under the microscope to try to see if they're straight or if they're bent. Um, spirillum forms spirals like this one right here. They don't have to have flagella, so don't let the flagella trick you into something else, but we're just going to have sort of that corkscrew shape thing going on here. The other thing that would be a good thing for you to write for spirillum is that it's rigid. This one is different from this one because this is rigid, this is flexible. So a spirochete is also corkscrew shaped or spiral shaped, but it's flexible and they move around differently. All right, pleomorphic means the cells don't have a standard shape. This very often means that the cell doesn't have a cell wall. And so the cells can be really long. They can be rod shaped. They can be blob shaped. They can be whatever shape you want to call this one. I'm going to call it eggplant shaped just for fun. Um, this was from a blood smear in somebody and this is, this is not okay to have in there. Hmm. Um, next up, some prefixes that you might find. Diplo means two. So a diplococcus means that you have two coccuses that are fused together. So this is a diplococcus right here. Strepto means you get chains. So if you have sort of like a string of pearls thing going on, you would have a streptococcus. You can also have streptobacillus because bacilli will form chains very often as well. So you can just put the prefix in front of the shape and that tells you a lot about the organism. Um, let's see, so strepto chain, got it. Diplococcus should have gotten that pericoccus or pair of cocci. Hmm. Uh, what does the prefix staphylo mean? Oh, I guess I wanted to show you more pictures. So diplococcus, uh, gonorrhea is very often a diplococcus. It's Nizeria gonorrhea. And so here's an unfortunate penis that has gonorrhea on it. If you were to stain some of the pus that's coming out of his urethral sphincter, uh, you would be able to see these organisms under the microscope. Streptococcus, streptococcus pyogenes is the causative agent of strep throat, which I mean, this person's got some pus patches going on back here on the two palatine tonsils. That used to be the definitive characteristic of strep throat, but now they have to do an assay to tell you whether or not you have it. But if you were to culture that, you'd see a lot of these guys under the microscope. All right, so staphylo clusters. Mm. Um, so you're gonna see just like a cluster of grapes of them. Bacilli don't really do clusters very well. So usually if you've got staphylo, coccus is probably gonna follow that because cocci are really the only ones that do that. Um, I mentioned staph infections or MRSA. Uh, MRSA is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus means clusters of cocci under the microscope. All right, so let's see what we can get from things. This is the genus and species of a particular organism. Bacillus cereus, we always call it in lab B cereus because we usually abbreviate the genus. Plus it just sounds silly, B cereus. Um, the name tells you something, so you should have already been able to figure out what shape the organism was, but I've gone ahead and given you some pictures here to help you out. What disease can it cause? Foodborne illnesses like diarrhea or vomiting. Um, what kind of cell does it have? Look at it. You guys tell me. Pro or you? Prokaryotic, no nucleus. Describe the shape. It's in the name too, but bacillus. These are all very obviously rod-shaped bacteria. Um, the arrangement. We usually get chains, like you can see off over here, we've got a little chain going on. Sometimes you do get diplos. And so when you are writing this up for your unknown, for example, you would say, if you found this under the microscope, some diplobacilli and some streptobacilli, because you do see both. You can also find singles. So if you see just one cell hanging out by itself, you would just call that a singles. Bacillus does tend to like to do strepto more like this slide off over here though. Um, what kind of gram reaction does it have? Well, notice that it's purple. There is some odd colors up over here, but I'll come back to that in just a second. Purple is positive, so these are gram positive. Now, what happened as this person was making the slide is they decolorized a little bit too long, so some of the cells ended up losing the color, and that kind of goes back to what I was telling you earlier. Decolorizing is the most common mistake that people make. They either don't do it long enough or they do it for too long. This person did it for too long, and so they decolorized some of the cells under the scope. So they shouldn't have done that for quite as long as they did. 
Next, Micrococcus luteus is one of the other organisms that we are going to play with at first in lab. And again, the name tells you a lot about the organism. Micro means small, coccus means coccus or ball shaped. Uh, this organism is part of the normal microbiota. Where can it be found? Skin and part of the upper respiratory tract. What kind of cell does it have? Look at it. Is that pro or eukaryotic? Pro. Describe the shape. Caucus. Describe the arrangement. This time we have clusters, and so you would say that this is a staphylococcus. Even though that's not the genus name, if we're talking about shape and arrangement, that's still a staphylococcus. Um, what kind of gram reaction does it have? Pink or purple? It's purple, and so that means it's gram positive. Alrighty. After that, I gave you a picture that's straight from your textbook to label. This one is a different picture of it, but it's just still a little cartoony picture to show you the basic parts that a prokaryotic cell is going to have. We're going to have a single, it's actually a circular chromosome, although it's just kind of thrown in the middle of the cell, so you can't really tell that it's a circle shape, but they don't have linear chromosomes like we do. They have a circular one. The area inside the cell where you can find that is called the nucleoid. Cytoplasm is everything between the plasma membrane and the nucleoid, so it's all of this stuff out here. Um, we're going to ignore that one because not all cells have that. Uh, pili is plural, pilus is singular. Pili are these little extensions that cells can have to help with DNA exchange or to help them stick to things. Capsule is not present on all cells, but if a cell has it, it's outside of both the plasma membrane and the cell wall, and it tends to help them create biofilms or evade your immune system. Cytoplasmic membrane is the same thing as the plasma membrane, so that's the phospholipid bilayer. Cell wall is outside of that. For bacterial cells, it's made out of something called peptidoglycan. Granular inclusions may or may not be present, but that's usually some sort of food storage material. Ribosomes, um, it's the same as what it does in our cells. It's protein synthesis. It is important to know, though, that their ribosomes are different than ours. Specifically, it is smaller than ours. And then some bacterial cells will have flagellum. Some will have one, in which case the singular is flagellum. Some will have a bunch. If they have a bunch, their flagella is the plural of flagellum. All right, uh, next, define and describe the function of the following. Cytoplasm, it's all the material inside the membrane. Uh, the nucleoid is the region where you can find the DNA. Cytoplasmic membrane is the same thing as the plasma membrane. You do need to remember from whatever previous classes that you had, it's semi-permeable. Some things can get in, some can't. You need to remember that it's a phospholipid bilayer. There's protein scattered throughout. And then we're usually going to have some kind of steroid to help maintain how fluid some, some of the membrane happens to be fluid mosaic model. The proteins aren't stationary or static. They can move around within there because the whole membrane is a liquid. It's not a solid. And um, I've got a little link to just kind of show you what's going on with this because a lot of students struggle with the idea of your cell membrane not being solid. My computer has to think before it gets there apparently. You can do it computer. I have faith in you. If you could do it faster, I would be happy, computer. Yeah. Let me back out and see if it's going to show in the background. Between the living, we don't need to play between the living machinery of the inner cell and the harsh conditions of the outside world stands the cell's plasma membrane. As crucial as this barrier is, it's surprisingly flexible. Push it and watch it move. Poke hard enough and it might break and begin to regroup. The lipid molecules of the membrane naturally assemble in a double layer because their tails repel water as their heads attract it. Throw in some cholesterol and a few carbohydrates and you have the basic structure of a plasma membrane. Within these lipid molecules, we also find different proteins which do various things for the cell. For instance, they receive signals from the world outside, or they transport nutrients and waste. So nature composes the membrane with a combination or mosaic of different lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. And these molecules are not stationary. They constantly move within the structure, fluidly changing their positions. That's where I'm going to stop that video because it explained everything I needed it to. So let me close that out. And now I've got to scroll back to where I was because, of course, my computer can't remember that for me. Having one of those days. All right. Come on, computer. 
Okay, so the mosaic model, done. Next, what is meant by the phrase selectively permeable? Again, it just means some things can get through the membrane and some things cannot. Which substances can pass through the membrane? Anything that is small, non-polar, um, can get through that membrane all on its very own. A little bit of water too, even though water is a polar molecule, it's a really small molecule, so it can slip past as well. So I'm also giving you some examples in this picture. Oxygen and carbon dioxide, those are important for bacteria just like they are for us. Those can get through all on their own. They don't need a transporter in order to do that. Um, what things can't get through, that's anything that's large, like large proteins or large lipid molecules. Anything that has a charge, whether that's a polar molecule or an ionic molecule, those are going to have trouble too. Water can also be barricaded. It depends kind of on how bent the membrane happens to be at any time. So notice that water kind of can go on both sides of that. Um, water has its own special door to get th through too because water is really important for cells. But generally speaking, it can't really get through all on its own. It needs to have some sort of end or space between the phospholipids in order to squeeze through. Um, all of these next few terms you should have had in whatever previous science class you had, so I'm going to go past them real, real fast. So diffusion is movement of a solute from an area of high concentration to low. Osmosis is diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So here in this case, if this solute can pass through, it will diffuse from high to low. If it can't, though, water will osmose through the membrane to try to dilute the more concentrated side off over here. Um, tonicity, again, should have been covered really well in whatever previous class that you had. Um, darn, I was hoping I had pictures for it. So hypotonic means that something is less concentrated than a cell. If you put a cell into a hypotonic solution, it's going to absorb water and then swell, possibly rupture, but bacterial cells have a cell wall, so they'll usually just become what's known as turgid, which means firm or uh, pressurized, essentially. Hypertonic means more concentrated than a cell. If you put a cell into a hypertonic environment, they will lose water and they will shrivel up. The fancy word for that in bacterial cells is called plasmolysis. What will happen is the cytoplasm will shrivel away from the cell wall, and it's kind of like a raisin, but with a wall out here around it. Isotonic is the same concentration. If you put a cell into that, it won't gain or lose water. It will just stay at equilibrium where it already is. Mm. Um, eukaryotes have proteins that make up the electron transport chain in the mitochondria of their cells. Where can these be found in prokaryotes? Well, you got to remember prokaryotes don't have any membrane-bound organelles, and that includes mitochondria and chloroplasts, and so it can't be in those organelles. The only place where they have a phospholipid bilayer, which is where these proteins would be, is their cytoplasmic membrane. So their electron transport chain is in their cytoplasmic membrane or their plasma membrane, whichever one you want to call it is fine with me. What does that electron transport chain do? I guess I'll come back to this. It does the same thing in their cells as it does in ours, but most of the time people have forgotten this or they've got PTSD from getting a lesson on it previously. What the electron transport chain does is it transports electrons from one protein to the next to the next. As those electrons get shuttled from one protein to the next, they use the energy of that shuttling to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane, in this case towards the outside of the cell. Then those hydrogen ions are going to diffuse in through something called ATP synthase, which is a little turbine, and it's going to make that turbine spin. And that turbine is going to create ATP for their cells. And so the electron transport chain creates a sort of chemical concentration gradient so that the cells will be able to make ATP to power all of their reactions. And I'm going to say that in a different way at this point. This is a, probably more like how the book say it. But what does it do? It sequentially transfers electrons and moves protons, which are hydrogen ions, out of the cell. That creates an electrochemical gradient. So whichever way you want to say that in your notes, that's what it does. Now we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail on exam two. For right now, I really just want you to know it creates that diffusion gradient that's going to allow the cell to make some energy. Now, because that, I really want to stay on this slide, sorry. Because that hydrogen ion is just a proton, the energy that was created by this electron transport chain is called proton motive force. So what is proton motive force? It's a form of energy created by the electron transport chain. What can it help synthesize? ATP. And so that is the same as what it does in our cells. Hopefully that is just a refresher for you guys. But again, we'll come back to this in a lot more detail in later chapters. 
Next, what's the function of transport systems? Get things in or out of the cell, essentially. Um, they can get nutrients into the cell, other small molecules that are necessary, they're called primary metabolites, those can get into the cell. They can also be used to help remove waste from inside the cell to the outside of the cell and get toxins out of that cell as well. In fact, some bacteria are gaining antibiotic resistance by growing efflux pumps that pump the antibiotic out of the cell so that it can't hurt the cell anymore. And so that transport system is actually working to our detriment in that case, but to the bacteria's benefit. Oh, I guess I want to be on that side too. So facilitated diffusion. Anytime you see facilitated, it means helped. So it's helped diffusion. Simple diffusion is when something can just pass right through the plasma membrane. Facilitated means it can still pass through, but it has to pass through a door, and that door is going to be some sort of transport protein. And so anything that passes through here, still following its concentration gradient from high to low, that's going to be facilitated diffusion. Active transport means an ATP has to be spent to move something across the membrane. It's going to tend to be moving things against the concentration gradient whenever you do active transport. <coughs> Excuse me. Secretion, this is another active process that allows a cell to release a lot of something in a fairly narrow time frame. When we talk about secretion in AMP or freshman classes, we usually talk about it in relation to hormone release. So here they're showing you a pancreatic cell that is releasing insulin. This is secretion. Those vesicles merge with the plasma membrane and then dump the contents to the outside. But that release does require energy in order for it to happen. Um, next up. What is peptidoglycan? It is a component of the cell wall of bacteria and bacteria only. There are lots of organisms that have a cell wall, plants, fungi, some algae, archaeans, and bacteria. Only bacteria use peptidoglycan. Plants and fungi use cellulose and chitin, uh, respectively. Archaeans use something entirely different. And so here's why I'm kind of spouting on about this for just a little bit. Anything that is unique to bacteria that is a target that we can select for that will help us kill their cell without harming our cells. Since we don't make peptidoglycan, that means if we ingest some chemical that destroys peptidoglycan selectively, we can harm bacteria in our bodies without harming us at the same time. In fact, the very first ever mass-produced antibiotic, penicillin, that's exactly how it kills cells. It destroys their peptidoglycan that destroys the cell as a whole. Um, what are the two major subunits that make it up? They're called NAMs and NAGs, that's, and that's all we're going to call them, so NAMs and NAGs. You don't have to know what they stand for. Quite frankly, I don't even remember what they stand for. I'm sure your book says it, yeah. N-acetylmuramic acid and N-acetylglucosamine. So just call them NAMs and NAGs. These are present in both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms, but what you end up with is just chains of alternating NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, all the way down. When you get a chain of those, it's called a glycan chain. Now here's why I remind you, we're making peptidoglycan. This is why we have glycan, is because of the glycan chain, which is the alternating NAMs and NAGs. Um, said it, said it, said it. What holds the NAMs and NAGs together? Okay, essentially what I'm asking you right here is what holds the glycan chain to another glycan chain. So this is where we're gonna start to talk about these things that are often here. Now, each one of these colored balls is an amino acid. If you don't remember from your previous classes, amino acids make peptides, which make polypeptides, which make proteins. Since we are always going to have four amino acids put together, that makes a tetrapeptide, which means four amino acids. And so a tetrapeptide is a stretch of four amino acids. What happens here is gonna be different between gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. In a gram-positive organism, the tetrapeptides get linked by something that's called an interbridge. In a gram-negative organism, there is no interbridge. Instead, the tetrapeptides line up side by side and they directly link without any additional chemicals in between them. And so gram-negative cells still have the tetrapeptide, they just don't get that interbridge that goes in between them. Um, so yeah, gram-negative joined directly, gram-positive are linked by that peptide interbridge and then what holds the chains of NAMs and NAGs together? The tetrapeptide. Hopefully you've got all of that. I really recommend you doodle this picture in your notes. You don't have to label every amino acid. I don't care that you know about alanine or glutamic acid, but I do want you to know tetrapeptides, glycan chains, and then interbridges are only present in gram positives. 
Now let's come back to the peptidoglycan. We already know the glycan is the glycan chain. Peptido comes from the tetrapeptide part of this, and so it's part protein and it's part carbohydrate. That is what makes the cell wall of bacteria, and they are arranged in such a way that every single person with OCD is gonna be super happy about it. It is the most organized structure known to man, essentially. Um, what are some of the differences between gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls? Okay, so here's what we've already said. Gram-negative cells do not have the peptide inner bridge. Gram-positive cells do. So we said that already, but do make sure you have that in your notes. Now I'm gonna to switch to a different picture. This one shows you what a gram-positive cell wall looks like. You can see a glycan chain, glycan chain, glycan chain. You can see from top to bottom, they get linked together with these little tetrapeptides, interbridge, tetrapeptide. And so you can see all of that arrangement that we kind of started talking about in that first one. The next thing that I want you to get in your notes for a gram-positive cell is they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan outside of their cytoplasmic membrane. It is a very thick layer, and that thick layer is going to make gram-positive cells impermeable to a whole bunch of different substances because this doesn't let a lot of things through. It's a very good barrier, but it's a barrier that we can target very easily because it's got, we've got direct access to it. Directly outside of their cell is a target that we can hit to kill that cell without harming you at the same time. Um, let's see, other things that I want you to know. Um, Gram-positive organisms use tychoic acids to help hold in cations. Tychoic is T-E-I-C-H-O-I-C, -I -I and then acids. Um, I do also want you to know that gram-positive organisms are sensitive to penicillin. Again, that very first ever discovered in mass-produced antibiotic. And to something called lysozyme. If you don't remember lysozyme for a previous class, that is a chemical that you produce on mucous membranes and in your tears that helps by working very similarly to penicillin. It's essentially an antibiotic that you make to keep your mucous membranes um, bacteria levels down. They're not gonna create sterility, but they're gonna at least kill off a lot of bacteria that try to land there by destroying the cell wall of the bacteria that land there. Okay, this picture shows you the anatomy of a grim negative cell wall and it looks very different. First off, we already said no inner bridge. Um, Next thing you need to write is they have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. Notice they really, in this picture, just have one little layer right here. But then, outside of that, they have an outer membrane. That outer membrane is half phospholipid bilayer, so it's one layer of phospholipids. And then, it's something called LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide. If you break that word down, saccharide means sugar, Poly means a bunch of them, and lipo means fat. So it's a carbohydrate with fats attached to it. So the fatty parts line up with the nonpolar part of the phospholipids, and then we end up with this little tail that is a carbohydrate chain coming off the top right here. Um, there are some very significant issues that come along from this outer membrane that we have right here. First off, it also has transport proteins in it that can allow things to get in and out of a cell. So gram-negative cells tend to be able to communicate with the outside environment a little bit more easily than a gram-positive cell can, and it's because this is more permeable than a big thick layer of peptidoglycan is. Um, second, this LPS that gets used to make the outer membrane, your body absolutely hates it. Um, one teeny tiny drop of lipopolysaccharide will set your immune system to such overdrive that it can cause sepsis and kill a person. And so it's not something that you want just traveling around in your bloodstream or in a place where you have direct access to the immune system. Because LPS is very toxic, it is called endotoxin. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a later chapter. But now I wanna make sure you have everything that you need in your gram-negative notes for this same question. Thin peptidoglycan, said it earlier, make sure you have it written down. They have an outer membrane with LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide. They have porin proteins to allow molecules to pass through the outer membrane. And they are, I did not say this one earlier, so make sure you get it. They are not susceptible to penicillin and lysozyme because those drugs don't have direct access to the peptidoglycan. And so those drugs can't hurt a gram negative cell. Okay, here we go. Moving right along, explain the importance of lipopolysaccharide. I kind of said this earlier, but I wanted to reiterate, again, it is very important. Even a dead gram-negative cell in your body is still toxic to your body because of the LPS that's in there. Um, it signals that a gram-negative organism has entered the body and it triggers an immune response. Um, 
you do need to also go ahead and write in here it's also known as endotoxin e-n-d-o toxin um, and that endotoxin has to be tested for in anything that is being um, administered through IV lines into a person that includes the needle doesn't just have to be sterile it has to also be free of LPS so those things have to be tested prior to being packaged that includes IV lines IV bags and any med that's going to be given intravenously all of those things have to be tested to make sure they are free of LPS prior to injection into a person that usually does happen at the factories that make those things but sometimes if a drugs being compounded medical professionals can have to test for that and we'll kind of come back to that later on and talk about it too. So I mentioned that penicillin destroys the cell wall. What I want you to understand is how does just destroying the cell wall actually kill the cell? Well, this goes back to that tonicity stuff that we were talking about earlier where you have hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic. A lot of times bacterial cells um, are not in an isotonic environment. If you rupture the cell wall, what that means is it no longer can build up that turgor pressure that it's supposed to be able to create to be a nice, normal, happy cell. And so since it doesn't have the cell wall, the cytoplasmic membrane will just rupture and then the contents of that cell will flow out and you have killed the cell. That's called lysis when that happens, L-Y-S-I-S. Um, so here's what I had written down in my notes just to make sure you have it. It weakens the cell wall and that can make the cell burst. Now, I mentioned these two things earlier, but I wanted to make sure you have the specifics. So what penicillin does, it prevents cross-linking of the glycan chains. Remember those glycan chains, that's the alternating NAMs and NAGs. It prevents that. Um, you also need to know it works better on gram-positive organisms because of all those reasons that we said earlier. Lysozyme works on peptidoglycan too, but it breaks the glycan chains not just preventing glycan chains from linking to each other it breaks the chain itself that's how lysozyme destroys and then you need to know that that's found in body secretions and it also works better on gram positive organisms mm. um, do all bacteria have cell walls no we already mentioned um, a word earlier pleomorphic that means that a cell doesn't have a traditional shape and that's very often because they don't have a cell wall um, this is mycoplasma it's very often pleomorphic mm. Um, okay, the bacillus shaped in this picture, what is it? So, you have to remember what bacillus means. That means rod shaped. So these pink ones are rod shaped and pink means negative. So they are gram negative. Would penicillin be effective against this? Well, you gotta remember this one's the pleomorphic one, abnormal shapes all over the place. If it's pleomorphic, it's because it doesn't have a cell wall. Since penicillin attacks the cell wall, that means that this bacterial species is naturally resistant to penicillin because it's missing the target that penicillin actually acts on. Next up, components that can be found outside of the cell wall. So the difference between these is a capsule is usually a distinct layer that's present outside of the cell. So here we're looking at the intestinal lining. This is a bacterial cell that's just kind of trying to glue itself to your lining. This is the capsule outside of that cell. Notice it's a very big, thick layer, and it's helping that cell glue itself to you so that you don't just poop that cell out. Slime layers are different. They are diffuse. It's hard to see where they start and where they stop. Instead of helping a cell stick to something, they're usually helping the cell avoid phagocytosis or predation if you kind of want to look at it as a predatory issue. So the way your book describes slime layer is it's diffuse and irregular, but it's outside of that cell wall as well. Um, glycocalyx is the sugary coating, if you will, outside of the cell. So the capsule and the slime layer are a part of that, but it's just any carbohydrate that you have outside of the cell that kind of marks that cell as being, in our case, foreign to us. It's how our cell recognizes it as it's bad and that we want to kill it. Advantage of having capsules and slime layers helps them stick to different things better. Um, incidentally, tartar is so hard to scrape off because the slime layer and the capsule created by the different species that you have in there helps glue the bacteria to your teeth. So they have to use those horrible sharp metal things to scrape them off. Um, it also helps them evade your immune system because it's really hard for your white blood cell to eat something that's slippery. They have to be able to stick to it in order to eat it. And so that makes it harder for them to do that. Um, you need to know that capsules and slime layers can allow bacterial um, communities to form to create something called a biofilm. Um, that allows bacteria to work together between different species to survive a little bit better. Um, 
Yeah, I said everything I wanted to say for that one. So it helps the bacteria if they have a capsule or a slime layer. It gives them additional protection, essentially. Uh, flagella is that little whip-like tail that can help cells swim. Again, sometimes they just have one. If it's just one, it's a flagellum. If they have more than one, they have flagella, plural. They can have one on one side, one on both sides. They can have a bazillion of them. They can have a few of them coming off one side, like a little ponytail for bacteria. And there's different words to describe each of those. So paratrichus is like this guy down here at the bottom. It means that they have flagella all over the surface of the cell. So this is D is a paratrichus one. Polar means that they just have one flagellum coming off one side. So A is a polar bacterial species because it just has that one coming off the one side. Um, chemotaxi. Chemotaxi is, the way that I usually like to describe this is imagine that you smell somebody making fresh baked chocolate chip cookies in your kitchen. What are you going to do? You're going to follow the chemical trail to the chocolate chip cookies and you're going to shovel chocolate chip cookies into your face. It's the same thing. You're smelling the cookies. That's a chemical sense. Well, bacteria can sense chemicals as well and then either swim towards or away from the chemical depending on what they're sensing. For example, if they sense nutrients, they can swim towards that nutrient. That's what's known as positive chemotaxi. If, on the other hand, they sense toxins being released by, let's say, a cytotoxic T cell, they might swim away from that. That's called negative chemotaxy. So bacteria aren't swimming around necessarily randomly, although there is a slight random component to it. Um, they're swimming towards or away from something depending on what it is that they are responding to, whether it's a nutrient or a toxin or a waste or something. So sensing chemicals and moving towards or away from them, depending on what they are. That's what chemotaxi is. Uh, pili is plural. These are, so in this picture you can see they're not the same size as a flagellum. Here's your flagellum right here. These are all your pili. They're shorter, they're typically thinner as well. These can kind of work like little Velcro attachments so that they can stick to a surface and then not get washed away. There's also one, um, that is sometimes called a fimbri, that's usually going to be used for, well, how do I want to say that? I want to say that differently. Fimbri are the ones that are usually used for attachment. The sex pilus is not the regular one. It's this one that is kind of bigger than the other ones, and it's a tube as opposed to just like a hair-like extension. The reason why it's important to know it's a tube is they can actually take a plasmid, which is a small circular piece of DNA, ship it down that tube to another bacterial cell and swap genes with another cell. So bacteria don't do sexual reproduction at all. They don't make gametes. They don't have gamete fusion and fertilization, which means all they can do is form clones of themselves. But that's not advantageous when the environment changes, and so they've got to have a way to swap genes between organisms, and the sex pilus is how they do that. Important that you understand they're not really having sex. They're just swapping genes between them. That is very medically relevant because if one species of bacteria that's living in your large intestine, for example, is antibiotic resistant, one of the reasons that they can be is because they have a plasmid that allows them to make an enzyme to break down an antibiotic. Well, if that cell swaps that plasmid with another species, it makes that species antibiotic resistant as well. And so they are swapping genes to our detriment in a lot of cases, but it benefits them. And that's the whole point of swapping genes is to benefit other organisms to increase survivability. Uh, next, chromosome for bacteria is a single circular chromosome. Again, it's not linear. They don't have 46 like we do. They have one and it's a circle. That is all the DNA that they have to do their regular metabolic functions, although they can have some extra DNA, those plasmids that I was talking about just a second ago. Uh, nucleoid, we already said this is the region where you can find the DNA. Plasmids are those small extra pieces of DNA that the cell may or may not have. If we have a sex pilus, the plasmid is what gets swapped down the sex pilus between one cell and another cell. Again, they may or may not have those plasmids though. Mm -hmm. Um, ribosomes are for protein synthesis. It is again important for you to understand that bacterial ribosomes are smaller than your ribosomes. That means that's another thing that we can target in their cells that won't harm you. We'll come back to that later on. Um, cytoskeleton, it's very different from ours. It is made out of proteins and it is still involved in cell division, but they use different types of proteins than we do. Um, storage granules do exactly what the name says. Usually it stores some kind of nutrient inside the cell. 
Gas vesicles is used for aquatic organisms, kind of like a swim bladder in a fish. It can allow the bacteria to float up towards the surface when the sun's out and then sink down where it's safer when the sun goes away. So think swim bladder for gas vesicles. Um, endospore we talked about in chapter one, that was that heat resistant form of life. I will also add, not only is it heat resistant, it's resistant to chemical disinfectants and acids as well. Um, germinate means that something is going, like if you have an endospore, it's not a vegetative cell. Remember that. It's a dormant cell that's not doing anything. If an endospore lands in an environment that is now safe for it, it will germinate, which means switch from being an endospore to a vegetative cell. So germinate is sort of like activate. It turns the endospore back on and converts it into a vegetative cell. And then a vegetative cell is again just a typical multiplying bacterial cell. Um, explain the process of sporulation. This is the process that creates the endospore. Kind of described it a little bit in the last chapter. It's kind of like binary fission, but instead of making two functional cells, one of the cells is going to be thrown away at the end and it's going to sacrifice its additional layer of cell wall to create one cell that doesn't have very much cytoplasm, but has lots of cell wall around it to help protect it. So sporulation makes the endospore. This is the picture from your book. It explains the process pretty well, but make sure you understand how that works. Uh, next, model organism for cell walls and outer membranes, Clostridium botulinum. Uh, what is the gram reaction of this species? It's gram positive. Uh, what disease does it cause? It causes botulism. Um, symptoms for botulism includes muscle paralysis and cessation of breathing, which leads to death. So this is not one that just makes you wish you hadn't eaten that food. It kills you. Um, how is it transmitted? Through improper canning and through honey. And I'm going to come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, would this organism have lipopolysaccharide in its cell wall? Well, to answer this one, you should be able to look back at how, you, how we answered the first question. It's gram-positive. Would a gram-positive organism have LPS? No, only gram-negative organisms do, so no. Can this organism form an endospore? Yes. How does Botox relate to this? Botox is botulinum toxin. It is the toxin produced by, pardon me, this species of bacteria, Clostridium botulinum. Now, here's the, I'll come back to it part. There is now a growing trend where people are starting the process of canning their own food. If you do not can your food correctly, Clostridium is a species that can grow anaerobically, which means if you didn't heat this successfully enough to kill all the Clostridium, even if you close this, it can survive inside without oxygen for years. If you then open this later on and eat it, there's lots of toxin in there. That botulinum toxin that again causes muscle paralysis, which stops your breathing and flat out kills you. This is why if you do not know what you're doing, you should not can your own food. It's a very risky thing. It's also why there's um, a lot of people out there who won't eat any like soup or whatever if the can has been damaged. It used to be common knowledge that if the can looked like it was sort of poofing up, this was inside of there. That's not as common knowledge anymore is what I am learning. So if you find cans that are damaged, like they look like they have poofed out some or they've expanded, do not eat from that. But if it's dented, it probably just fell and it's fine. You just don't want one that's expanding. Expanding cans, bad. Now, coming back to the honey. All honey has this warning on it, and a lot of people have a misconception that the reason for that is because honey is so thick, kids can't eat it. That's not why that warning is there. That warning is there because honey is a natural product that is created by bee spit. Whether you want to think of it that way or not, that's what honey is. There's very often a couple of clostridium cells inside the honey. The thing is, it's just a couple. Honey happens to be very antibacterial because it is super hypertonic. Most cells can't survive in there. Well, clostridium can survive, but it can't reproduce. If you eat some honey, you'll get a couple of cells in there, but not enough to mass produce that toxin, so you'll be just fine from it. But infants don't have a very good immune system, and so when they get exposed to that couple of cells, those couple of cells can start to produce the toxin and then lead to those problems, the paralysis that I mentioned earlier. So never give honey to a kid that's less than one because their immune system just don't know how to deal with those couple cells. You will be just fine unless you're severely immunocompromised, and then you should probably try to avoid honey as well. 
Um, this picture up over here is to show you the endospore that's being formed. This cell is in the process of sporulation. That's going to be the spore. This is going to be the thrown away part off over here. And you can see that second cell wall even starting to try to compress to form the additional layers outside of that. So the only other thing that I said here is you should also recognize plant and animal cells. Since you should have all had a previous science class, you should remember your basic anatomy. Now, A&P students, you maybe don't remember your specific plant stuff, but your book does have pictures of plant and animal cells. You should all know animal stuff. I went ahead and gave you a picture. I think it's from the A&P textbook, so you can relabel an animal cell just to get your stuff down. For my A&P students, here's a typical plant cell. And let me kind of run you through it. They have all the same stuff that an animal cell has. Nucleus, nucleolus, mitochondria, rough ER, smooth ER, Golgi apparatus. They still have a plasma membrane. But they have some additional stuff that animal cells don't have. They have a cell wall. It's made out of cellulose, not peptidoglycan. They have a large central vacuole that stores a bunch of water and creates turgor pressure. There's also some additional molecules that are in there, especially if you have some plants to do special photosynthesis. They store that within the central vacuole. And then we have chloroplasts, those are the organelles that carry out photosynthesis. Plants do not usually have lysosomes, and while they do have a centrosome, they don't have centrioles inside their centrosome. And so there's some other differences between plants and uh, animal cells. But make sure you spend some time studying those since you should have had most of those before. That is where chapter three is going to stop you.